Welcome to the Friends of Work podcast, the podcast about mastering emotional intelligence at work. In the coming weeks, the Friends of Work podcast with Aditya will be bringing you even more exciting guests and events. To support this podcast and to learn more about our future plans, please go to patreon.com slash friends at work. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash friends at work. Thank you. Have you ever wanted to know how pilots deal with jet lag? Or what happens behind the scenes before every flight? Or like me, have you ever wanted to know if a plane is started like a car ignition? These and many more topics were covered in my conversation with Austin Foster, a pilot for a major U.S. airline. We also discussed the uniqueness of work life as a pilot. If you fly or if you've flown at all, this is one episode you want to listen to. Here's our conversation. My name is Austin Foster, and I am a pilot for a major U.S. airline here in uh, Washington, D.C., and I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, Mm -hmm. downtown Silver Spring. Lots of fun stuff happening down here. Yeah, yeah. I love this place. uh, Yeah. Live here uh, with my wife. Been married uh, about going on five years now. Just past four, but we like to... Yeah, stretch it to the Str- next one, <laughs> the next anniversary. Uh, but yeah, enjoy uh, being downtown in Silver Spring, and in my free time, I love to play the guitar and make music and hang out with my friends and try to brew beer, things like that. Nice. Yeah. And oh, you, you forgot to add that uh, a number of the episodes of this podcast were edited by you. Yeah, I have had my hand in a few of these, uh, the post-production work on some of this stuff. So nice. It's, it's an honor to be a guest on the show. And it's an honor to have a pilot yeah. <laughs> doing post-production you should feel work. You should feel really special. <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel special. <laughs> All right, so um, what kind of aircrafts do you fly? Uh, right now, I just fly the uh, Boeing 757 and Boeing 767. Okay. Um, what kind of planes are those? Like uh, capacity? Yeah. They're uh, what I would call medium to long haul aircraft. Okay. So we do a lot of uh, flights to Europe and Hawaii from, from the East Coast and obviously coast to coast stuff. So there are two engine airplanes anywhere from 200 to 200. 40 passengers nice in size yep yeah have you always wanted to fly yeah since i was about 12 years old uh it was the first time i became interested in airplanes and aviation and just you know kind of we call it you know we got bit by the bug the aviation Mm -hmm. bug i don't Mm -hmm. i don't exactly remember the the whole chain of events but one day i came home from school and there was this pamphlet uh, from the Smithsonian Institute in our mailbox that was all about commercial aviation. And I just, it, for whatever reason, it caught me at a very specific time in my life where I was maybe looking for direction mm-hmm. and trying to figure out, dreaming about what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I just became attached to it and just went all out into aviation and pursuing that dream. Wow. So when was your first flight? I was 16 years old the first time I flew. Nice. Yeah. Uh, was that a single engine plane? Or? Yeah. Yeah, just a little single engine Cessna. Hmm. And uh, I, I still remember everything about that day. And uh, <laughs> it was a pretty exhilarating experience to to go up and fly around and take the controls. And, you know, I, I felt like I was landing the airplane, but in all actuality, the instructor was probably... <laughs> actually landing the airplane but I I had practiced extensively uh, throughout the years on my home PC Microsoft flight simulator whoa I remember those yeah which I logged quite a few hours on that wow (laughs) yeah it was uh oh why you were kind of a nerdy thing to do but uh, (laughs) it it interested me at the time yeah while you were flying I couldn't figure out how to use that thing it was just I remember trying it out once or twice. I mean, the Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yeah. I was just, I was all over the, the place. Just three dimensionally, I think I may be handicapped. Yeah, it know. definitely takes a little <laughs> bit of uh, patience learning to, to quote unquote fly the simulator uh-huh. because 
unless you have a computer yoke or some sort of true you have to use the keypad and there's a the keyboard on the computer is basically just one giant shortcut mm-hmm. and so you know if you want to turn left turn right there's certain buttons that correspond with that and so you have to train your mind that the five or the the four or the whatever it is on the keypad turns the airplane exactly and the period is the parking brake you know, or something <laughs> like that so it, it's a really weird kind of transfer of of symbology from your what you want the plane to do by putting a keyboard command that doesn't make any sense exactly so that's how i flew the flight simulator but, hmm. but you you knew what you were doing at exactly least you, you, could, you were figuring it out yeah yeah nice yeah so i've always been curious about this and i think i've asked you about this earlier how do you start a plane do you start it like a car like turn on the ignition and like how do you kind do of that? well actually there the smaller airplanes you would start like that okay the little propeller cessnas and things like that it, okay. it is very similar to a car you just turn, turn the, key, the ignition it's in ignition and it, it'll fire up and things like that but for bigger airplanes it's a little bit different because um it actually takes uh, pneumatic air to start the engine. And so we have a few uh, procedures that we go through when we start the engine. You uh, have to engage the starter in uh, high pressure air from a what we call an auxil- auxiliary power unit, goes into the engine, spins the turbines really fast. Mm-hmm. At a certain speed, you introduce fuel, and then the rest is pretty much history. You just wait for the engine to come up to speed and make sure that none of the engine parameters are exceeded. Hmm. Uh, it's relatively easy, but if something were to go wrong, you would have to catch it pretty quick. If your temperatures got too hot or something like that, you'd have to take the fuel away from the engine and say, okay, no more burning of gas because you're, something's wrong with you. Hmm. And uh, some airplanes are easier than others. Some a computer really takes care of all that. And some airplanes are a little more archaic and res- in certain um, respect uh, yeah of how you don't want, start you, yeah you don't want to add fuel too soon you don't want to add fuel to the engine when it's not spinning up fast enough and you don't mm-hmm. want to wait too long to add fuel so from the time you initiate startup to when it starts like how long does that take uh generally a minute is is what i would i oh, would okay. say yeah some air some engines a little bit quicker than others mm-hmm. just depending upon the manufacturer of the engine but sometimes yeah, as, as short as 30 seconds I've seen, and then a, a minute hmm. is probably average. Nice. Yeah. So I, I read this in a Reader's Digest, and I, I, this quote from a followed first officer from Texas. He said, I know pilots who spend a quarter million on their education and training, and then that first year as a pilot, they qualify for food stamps. So what are some of the misconceptions the public has about being a pilot? Yeah, the because uh, I think people think pilots make you know a huge ton of money all over the place. Sure, yeah. Pilot. I mean, I would say that there's that's probably the the idea that most people have that pilots are well compensated, and and they generally are. It just depends on the size of the airplane you fly and maybe the the company that you work for and the size of that company. But you know the the financial burden for learning to fly is extremely high. Mm. And when I was 16, that was, you know, I'm aging myself here, but that was almost 18 years ago Mm -hmm. when I started to learn to fly. It was much more affordable. You know, in order to pay for flying lessons, I worked at a grocery store part-time after school and was able to accumulate a couple thousand dollars to pay for my pilot's license, just my private pilot's license. Mm. And then I, my dad helped me with about another thousand of it. So it cost me about $3,000 just to get my pilot's license. And that was only about 40 hours of flight time uh, and just kind of bare bones minimum experience. Yeah. And so to, to in order to reach a commercial professional level, you have to continue to add certifications to your, um, basically your, your flying skills. So then you, after private, you would go to instrument rating, then you would, uh, attain your commercial license, which just basically means you can get paid to fly. It doesn't mean a commercial license doesn't mean you can go fly commercial aircraft. Okay. It means you can do things like take skydivers up or Hmm. crop dusting or, uh, you know, sometimes at the beach you'll see airplanes flying by with banners. Yeah. Yeah. Really entry level aviation jobs. 
just because Interesting. You're, you're not you're not really a proven commodity yet mm. you are still very much cutting your teeth in aviation and you're learning how to make decisions and you're learning how how to be a pilot you know because to get your private pilot's license you only need 40 hours of flight time okay which in all honesty isn't that much flight time uh, most major airline pilots when they get hired by a major airline have upwards of 5,000 or more hours of flight time. Wow. So there's a, a large gap you have to, f- to fill from the moment you start flying until you get hired by a major U.S. airline. And it comes through, just like I said, increasing your credentials. And you know it costs a lot of money to get to the point where you can get paid and compensated to fly. So, so do you go hire a plane for all those times that you are you know, logging on flight times or do you have to buy your own plane? No, generally you can rent an airplane just like you would rent a car. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just fly as often as you can. Yeah, fly as often as you can, but a lot of... How cheap is it to... Excuse me. How cheap is it to rent... Rent an airplane now? An airplane. (laughs) When I... Just to give you an idea i started flying in may of 2001 okay which was a what we call a pre a pre 911 aviation world okay and a, you know, aviation changed a lot after 911 the, mm. a lot of new laws came in in effect and the costs went way up after 911 as well mm. so i i paid 60 dollars i think 60 dollars an hour Wow. To rent the airplane. Okay. And the inf- you have to play, pay for the flight instructor as well, his or her time to oh. instruct you. And so okay. that's usually another, that was another $20 an hour. Okay. So, but now those prices are about double hmm. in today's dollars. So in order to rent an airplane, just to learn to fly, you're probably going to pay $120 an hour and then $40 an hour for instruction. And the bare minimum is 40 hours to get your private pilot's license. So you're looking at, probably close to ten thousand dollars just to to get that entry level entry 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 level you can actually yeah where you can take your friends up on an airplane you can take grandma up for a ride whoever Mm -hmm. but you can't get paid for any of that you can't receive compensation Mm. so you still have a lot of what we call time building Mm. to get to the level of commercial pilot which takes 250 hours to get to become a commercial pilot and that's just again to Go toss people out of an airplane and let them <laughs> fall to the you know fall to the ground. Fall out of the their sky. parachute opens. Exactly. Yeah. Good gosh. Yeah. So um, another thing I heard is that long haul pilots always have to speak English. Why? I, I don't remember the exact history on on why that is, but aviation is the universal language. Uh, or English, rather. Is is that what I said? Avi- yeah. <laughs> English is. <laughs> I get what you. I, I I saw what you meant, like the right ball. across your face. <laughs> English, but the words came out as aviation. Yeah. I, I understand. Go on. <laughs> so aviation for me is the universal language. <laughs> no, I I think about it all the time because I'm obviously engrossed in it quite a bit. But uh, English is the international aviation language. Okay. Because they needed something that would kind of work across the board and they decided on English. I don't know if it's because most of, you know, the powers to be at that time were, you know, up, you know, U S and British and things like that were very much at the forefront of aviation development and technology. Mm-hmm. And so it, it just makes it streamlined across the board where, you know, you're, you're flying in France and everybody's speaking English for the most part. You mm-hmm. do hear some, some chatter in, in French from time to time, but if there's instructions or clearances, things that you have to do, it'll all be in English. Mm. So, you know, we part of situational awareness is also being able to know what other airplanes are doing. So we all need to be speaking the same language. We all need to be sharing the same, what we call mental model. Okay. That we, that helps keep everybody safe. You have to make sure that the plane coming in the opposite direction understands what you're saying. Yeah. So that you don't collide exactly. in the middle of the air. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. And even in other parts of the world, English is sometimes hard to understand. Mm. You know, we all emphasize different words differently. Yeah. And it's coming across a radio 
which isn't like this. It's not the fidelity of this. It's more like you're talking on a walkie talkie. Mm -hmm. So just imagine (laughs) phone conversations with a a French uh, speaking person speaking English. Yeah. But through a walkie talkie, even saying English words, you, I have to, my ears have to go on high alert. Like it, and it's usually, I'm usually pretty tired by that time of the flight too, when you're (laughs) coasting into France. Mm -hmm. So interesting. I mean, you can tell that, even both of us speak English slightly different. Right. And, and, and I've heard people speak English and I think they're speaking a different language too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like listen to people talk down South. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. So, um, I've heard, um, also, so I, I've been listening, so I've been hearing all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. I heard also that pilots don't eat the same food as the passengers. Is that true? And if it is, why? I, that might have used to be been the case. I'm not so sure it is anymore. Because okay. a lot of times when we're on our flights, the flight attendants will, when we're preparing for takeoff, they'll send a sheet of paper up that's got all the first class meals on it. Mm. And we kind of, you know, might have a fish dish or a, a steak or chicken. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll rank in order which one we want based on availability. Okay. And... You might not get what you want because some of the customers in the back may take up all the Thai chicken or whatever that you really wanted was. You know, the, yeah. And so you might get the chicken option. But that's generally the premium food is what I would call it. It's the, the food they serve first class. Mm-hmm. And the way that it works is if they have extra, they'll give some of it to us. Okay. Because it is a little bit better than what the crew food that they provide us. So we do get the options of the same choices that I described, but it's maybe a little bit less quality and I don't know where it comes from. Can eat different food than what the passengers eat, but then in a sense we can eat the same food just depending on availability. Okay. But I've never heard of a strict, you know, in order to prevent against food poisoning or something like that, that mm-hmm. we would eat something different than the passengers. So we, we can eat the same thing. That's good. Mm-hmm. Cause, uh, that was exactly what I, in my research, that's what exactly what I saw that, uh, someone mentioned in one of the articles that to avoid food poisoning, pilots usually don't eat the same thing as passengers, but you're saying that in practice, that's not necessarily so. Yeah, that's at not least in your experience. Exactly. Yeah, and I've never read anything in any of our manuals or publications about us receiving different, you know, food. It it all comes from the same place. Usually the same airport uh, food prep. Mm-hmm. It's from the same caterer. It's not. Yeah, I don't think they have a sealed off <laughs> room that says pilot food. Yeah, <laughs> with people in spacesuits. Yeah, like. Yeah, vacuum sealed. and It might actually even be safer, the way you describe. Because if they say pilot food, if they got to it, if for whatever nefarious reasons or uh, there was some contamination that happened and it only happened with the pilot food, it could be more dangerous. Yeah, that seems like a security risk to me <laughs> to basically have this food that's, as it's going down the line, it's everybody knows it's for the flight crew. Mm. I, I could see somebody not making good decisions if they had, you know, bad intentions. True. So hmm. interesting. Yeah. So this leads me to a, to a question and I, and I want to read a comment that I read from a UK publication. I think the telegraph in the UK, it was, it was an article about things pilots have said during flights and This one says, a few years ago, on a flight from Paris to Dublin, the crew played in English the correct announcement. The captain has switched on the seatbelt sign, or something like that. But in French, they mistakenly played the announcement to adopt the brace position in preparation for a crash landing. All the French passengers immediately went into a panic, while the rest of us wondered what the fuss was about. So have you experienced anything like this story? Uh, or, or have you heard anything happen of this nature in the industry in recent times? This, I, I believe, happened 
probably pre 9 11 because a lot of the examples given in this particular article that I'm referencing were written about some older flight experiences. You know, I, I do remember hearing one case of an airplane somewhere a couple of years ago. The pilots, you know, when they come over at cruise altitude and they say, hey, you know, we're cruising at 39,000 feet, it's going to be a smooth ride, fasten seatbelt signs coming off, or we're about to, you know, we're about to start our initial descent. Any kind of, you know, generic kind of regular old comment about mm-hmm. the flight. We're, we're, we're switching where we're talking to, you know, whenever we key the mic. Okay. Yeah, so we're choosing to speak in the back to the passengers, and you have to physically switch, r- switch your mic back okay. to talk to air traffic control. Okay. And I think what happened was air traffic control gave this flight a descent, and they had delayed the airplane the pilots had delayed the descent maybe i, I don't know if my details are right mm-hmm. but they hadn't started the descent down yet and so whenever he got done talking to the passengers the, the pilot didn't switch back to air traffic control oh wow and then he thought he did and so he told air traffic control he said okay we're going down now <laughs> and that got broadcast over over the, yeah, yeah to and the it, passengers that will freak everybody out and i out. think some people Obviously, their pilot just said, we're going down now over the loudspeaker. And nobody knew what was going on. And in all actuality, he, anytime we leave an altitude, we have to tell our tra- air traffic control. And so he just meant to tell air traffic control, oh, we're going down now. We're starting our descent. Yeah. So that, 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 that is a weird miscommunication that, yeah. that would freak anybody out. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean... Uh, I read a lot of really interesting stories. Here's another one. Uh, it says here, um, long time ago, as a young teen flying from San Juan to New York, there was a big bang and the cabin lights went out. I had actually experienced this before. I knew it was a lightning strike. So wasn't worried. Lots of stormy weather in that neck of the woods. Some passengers had a little ripple of concern and then settled down. Lights came back. Then the captain said, Ladies and gentlemen, we were just struck by lightning. Now, that sent the passengers into a complete tease. Some crying, and for some reason I have never understood, some climbed over the back of their seats. One presumably green flight attendant went pale and just kind of dropped, not to a faint, but more of a prayer. If the pilot hadn't said anything, it would have been a lot better. Do pilots get trained on how to speak to passengers or are you just expected to wing it? Yeah. I, in a way we are expected to wing it. Okay. That, that is true. There is definitely an element of what I would describe as bedside manner, Mm. much like a doctor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to deliver news. That's not great in a way that doesn't scare people. Mm. And you know, it, it takes a lot uh, a lot of little mistakes to bring an airplane down or one big mistake. I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know of any exact time that a lightning strike has brought an airplane down. I think there has been one, but I don't remember the details. I think it was a long time ago and it was during the beginning of what we call the jet age. Okay. Whenever jets were, were flying passengers very early on in the history of aviation Mm -hmm. after you know going from the reciprocating piston airplane engines to the jets to the jets yeah there was still a lot of things that they hadn't figured out about jet aviation and i think uh i don't believe they had installed what they call static wicks on a lot of what are those it's just a a little it looks like kind of like a pen. It's probably the, the length of a, a, a writing utensil a pen, but it's attached to the, the trailing edge of the wing mm-hmm. or the tail, and it just dissipates static electricity. Oh, I think I've noticed those. Yeah, you see them on the edge of the wings. The yeah, the there's wings. usually maybe like 10 of them mm-hmm. out there on the wings. And, you know, an airplane will generate static electricity as it moves through the air, and so that needs to move out of the airplane, and that's what those little wicks are for Mm. so if if an airplane was to get struck by lightning uh it it would i think probably lose some power for a little bit until that little ball of electricity and energy 
finds its way out of the airplane. A lot of times it finds its way out uh, through a hole in the wing. Like so a, it can it, make a dis- hole. Oh, it can make. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you okay. You might have to Google that. Okay. <laughs> I don't have any firsthand experience on that, and I'm not an expert in that, but mm. uh, I know it has happened where airplanes have gotten struck by lightning, but most of the power was, was restored and the airplanes landed safely without any issue. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. cool. So speaking about nature and man trying to conquer the air through flight, I've read about updrafts and turbulence. Can you talk a bit about those and what would you do and tell your passengers in those scenarios? Yeah, well, I guess turbulence to me is uh, not much different than just to get a visual kind of an analogy for how I picture turbulence is much like you would you'd see the ocean, you know, air air and fluid kind of react Mm -hmm. similar when their kind of uh, forces acted upon them. Mm-hmm. And just like you look at the, the water on a really beautiful day on the ocean, it looks really smooth. Air, air can be like that too. But sometimes you look at the ocean and there's currents and things crashing into each other and creating these little eddies and things like that. And mm-hmm. that's a lot of times that's what turbulence is in the sky. You have different air currents converging and instability in the atmosphere and things like that, that cause turbulent turbulence. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the most usually the most severe turbulence that you will ever find in in the flying world is through what we call convective activity activity Tur- uh, turbulence attributed to thunderstorms okay and things like that and that's okay. where you're getting the most what you say like updrafts and rising currents of air that you could go through that would cause uh, people to if they weren't strapped down they could hit the ceiling or have stuff fall on them. Or oh, is that usually that. when the the fasten seat belt like comes on when you, as a pilot, feel like there might be an updraft in particular, or just any sort of turbulence? Oh, well, because you don't know how it would act. Well, generally, whenever we're flying along, we we rely a lot on what are called uh, pilot reports, which are just kind of. Like, hey, you know, the old, the kind of the age old thing of like, when you guys went through, what did you see? Mm-hmm. And it's just, uh, there's an airplane a hundred miles ahead of you that reported moderate turbulence. Okay. And so, you know, okay, in a hundred miles, that's maybe like, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, or, you know, we're going to be experiencing some moderate turbulence because mm-hmm. we're at the same altitude. We're on the same exact path. We call the flight incidents and we say, hey, you know, we're, we're about to experience some turbulence. Why don't you go ahead and you know, take a seat and we'll, we'll let you know when it's safe to get back up. And we'll make an announcement to the passengers and say, we are about to experience just a little bit of moderate turbulence. Give them an estimate of how long it might last and just remind them to have their seatbelt securely fastened. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, it, you know, just you maybe that bad or, or a little bit worse, but it's, that's generally pretty we, much. Yeah. We, the worst turbulence again is in thunderstorms, and you just steer clear of those. Don't fly through a thunderstorm. Is your, is your best, it's the best avoidance option. technique? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> just avoid it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, jets are fast, and thunderstorms are usually you know, twenty thirty miles, and you're around it. And oh, you can pretty much just fly around. Yeah, the if, if they're pretty isolated cells, you just you deviate maybe ten degrees to the left, fly around it. Or if they're not very tall thunderstorms, sometimes the thunderstorms are only 30,000 feet Mm -hmm. tall, you might, you just fly right over it. Okay. I didn't think you could fly over it. I mean, just visualizing that, that's pretty interesting. Uh, Yeah, thunderstorms vary in height based on where you're at in the globe. Mm. Uh, In the northern hemisphere, they tend to be a little bit lower. Uh, In the equatorial regions, uh, Mm -hmm. they're very high. You can't fly over them because they go sixty thousand feet into the sky. So you wow. gotta fly around them. Hmm. Yeah. So do pilots experience air sickness? I don't know of any that do. Okay. I never have, but you know maybe if you were we're getting sick, got sick during the middle of the flight, you know it could be mistaken for air sickness, and maybe you're just really sick. Okay. But I don't. I don't I, <laughs> You know, I think it's a, it's kind of a, 
air sickness might have something to do with an element of not feeling like you're in control maybe sometimes Mm -hmm. and not being able to see forward. You know, there's certain tricks that our body plays on us because it wasn't necessarily intended to fly Mm -hmm. through the sky yeah, like a bird, but we do now. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, again, I don't know of any pilots that experience air sickness and I never have. Okay. I mean, you've flown for hours, so yeah. hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, thousands of hours. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so what do pilots do to pass the time during long flights? Uh, we eat, <laughs> drink coffee. No. No. <laughs> no, we do more than that. <laughs> Stare out the window. <laughs> Generally, uh, you know, takeoff and landing are the two busiest are the busiest times of a flight because your, your, your workload is high. You're, you're busy taking off, you're climbing up to altitude, you're making sure everything's looking good and you get to cruise altitude. That's where the, the workload dramatically reduces, mm-hmm. but we still we we talk to air traffic control all the way across the country. Like we do, like I was talking about pilot reports. We talk, we find out where the smooth air is. We find out, um, scores to football games you know, <laughs> sometimes there's curi- curious passengers on the airplanes that want to know yeah so how do they contact I, i've read about that i've never experienced it on any flight but the people who actually ask the pilot from the is it from first class or from where well the, the flight attendants will call us they have a direct line to us and yes the, the passengers will ask the flight attendant hey we have a question for the flight crew and they'll just relay the message and so then people who ask for the football scores sure, in yeah, the middle of just the flight. This, yeah, just this last, uh, what was it, a, earlier, earlier this month was the mm-hmm. Super Bowl, right? Yeah. So I was flying from L.A. to D.C. And, and the game started when we were probably over, like, I don't know, Kentucky or somewhere. Okay. And so at that point, we were starting to get requests, you know, hey, what's the score? What's the score? And uh Air traffic control was kind of given the score, but there were some in- inconsistencies with the uh, the score. I felt like, like okay, because you know one one air traffic control would say you know the Eagles are up over the Patriots, whatever, whatever, mm-hmm. and then the next person would give a, a score that's not even possible. Yeah, like they had the, the, the team switch. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, you can't lose points. <laughs> Somehow the Eagles lost points. But, okay. Uh, so we, we would actually would we have a computer system where we can talk directly to our dispatch. Okay. And they can relay a message to us giving us the, the actual score that we would then relay to the passengers. Over the PA system? No, we or would we would let directly the, to... I did it once on the um, when we started our initial descent just to kind of give everybody a heads up of what the score was. But that's not something I, I felt needed to be some people don't care about football. Some people yeah. may detest the game. And so I don't, I don't want to push, you know, that idea of, Oh, just cause other people want to know, we would just kind of let the flight attendants know. And then they'll relay that. To there the were passenger. certain people that were obviously interested in the score more than others. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. So as a frequent flyer yourself, as a pilot, mm-hmm. how do you deal with jet lag? Uh, that's, uh, never been a, a strong skill set that I've personally had whenever I've traveled because a lot of times I would go maybe uh, my wife and I went to Australia and Hawaii and Europe and things like that but we would stay longer than what I generally stay now mm-hmm. we would be going on vacation and so I would just kind of get acclimated to wherever I was going and just deal with it but whenever I go to Europe for, while you're working while I'm working I generally don't acclimate myself to local time I just trust my body and if my body's really tired I sleep okay and then sometimes I push push it a little bit just to stay up a little bit longer so that I get a good night's sleep mm-hmm. because you know I I come home I turn around I come home and um you just you know you just get through it I, I wouldn't say there's like a great strategy. Okay. We get rest breaks during the flight where we get to go back and mm-hmm. take a couple hour nap. Mm-hmm. And so that, that helps a lot. Okay. But the, the guys that I've talked to that have been doing this for 30 years say that it never gets any easier and it never gets any easier. Wow. Sometimes you just kind of learn how to operate in a little bit of a, 
deficiency of sleep. Not that you're fatigued or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You just learn how to trust your body to when you, if you land uh, after flying from the East coast of the United States over to Europe, it's a, you know, six, seven, eight hour flight, depending on where you're going, Mm -hmm. you're generally pretty tired. So sleep for four or five hours when you get to your hotel room and then go do something, get out, take a walk, go to a restaurant, see the sights, Mm -hmm. And then try, I try to stay up a little bit later into the night so that I sleep through the night. Cause if I I go to bed too early, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and you know, I guess our situation is a little different than maybe just the general public's flying and going on vacation. They don't have to be rested for really anything. You know, they don't have to be rested for duty or anything like that. Yeah, but I, I, I do know someone. I, actually, we both know, both know this person who sometimes travels mm-hmm. for work and have to be in multiple countries within a short period of time. Sure. And just kind of like you, I've always wondered how they dealt with jet lag and being in different time zones mm-hmm. and just not and just functioning. It's it's. I think it's pretty tough. No, it is. I, I totally agree. Sometimes you walk around and you kind of feel like you're just in a funk, mm-hmm. you know, in a haze. And you just, you're in a really neat place, but you're not necessarily totally engaged. Mm. You're just kind of walking around. You're in Rome and you're like, oh, there's the Coliseum. You know, I should be more excited, but I'm kind of tired. Yeah. <laughs> and I know I need to stay awake in order to sleep well tonight so that I can fly back in the morning. Mm-hmm. So it, it's... I wouldn't say I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I don't enjoy that aspect of the job. Okay. Honestly, that's the most challenging part for me is is that what we call the circadian rhythm. Mm-hmm. You know, the understanding what your body needs and requires and you not being able to give it, give it what it needs because of the requirements of your job sometimes. Mm. It's challenging because I, I, I would love to have a more natural rhythm to life. Cause yeah. I, I feel like I thrive more in that, but my career choice doesn't allow it right now. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, in a previous conversation we had, you talked about the fact that you, at least in your current job, you rarely fly with the same people twice. That's correct, yeah. And so how do you connect? Now going to the heart of you know friends at work, how do you connect with people um, you know, and make potentially lasting relationships or, or is that even really possible? Is that a thing within your, your field or if not in your experience, do you know anybody or, or any other pilot that's able to do that, you know, connect on a, on a regular basis or is it just because of your job or your current job? Or is this true for across board for all pilots that you know that they are unable to connect uh, and have friends at work sure. that they have uh, established relationships with over time? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely know people uh, more so from my previous job that I worked at uh, prior to coming to this job where we had a, a much smaller pilot group. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I mean, we had a, uh, the amount of pilots we had at our company was probably around 300 versus where I'm at now, which is over 12,000. Wow. So there's definitely, uh, it's a bit harder to to make some of those lasting connections um, right now. But I still have several relationships from my previous job. Mm-hmm. And, a, and a lot of them work where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we're able to still connect from time to time. We don't see each other really at all <laughs> we, you know we text or maybe a phone call here and there yeah and but when we do see each other you know it's like a little reunion and we you know chit chat for 10 or 15 minutes and mm-hmm. it's good to catch up and see where everybody's at but it's just not it's just not a practical uh thing which is weird you know because mm-hmm. a lot of the guys that i fly with now are really great guys really really experienced they have a lot to share and you do develop a relationship with them over the course of a couple of days. But again, like I, I haven't flown with anybody twice. Wow. At, at my current uh, job. And I, I, been, ha- have I have you seen, been, have you been, how long have been at this? Uh, almost this a year. Wow. Yeah. But I also, I, I 
switched bases around you know i've been flying out of different parts of the country and now i'm officially kind of settled in dc mm-hmm. and there's a, a couple of people i've met here that i hope to fly with again mm-hmm. and you know i could see there's a, a couple of people that i've um, flown with at a previous base that transferred here to this base and you know we when we see each other we're like hey how's it going even though we don't we're not flying together during that trip okay. so there's lots of potential it just takes a long time because we don't see each other every day you know where, where if you work it's at not a, an everyday kind of yeah, job I'll, hanging yeah i mean sometimes you know i'll fly based on the way my schedule works sometimes i won't fly for a couple of weeks and who knows who i'm going to fly with you know it's generally not the people that i know mm-hmm. at least you know I, I get a chance to make new friends but then you're kind of, <laughs> you're kind of let down whenever you, you realize that you might not ever fly with them again. So it's a hi, bye yeah. kind of and, situation. And sometimes you're glad you don't have to fly with them again. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, which is true. No, for, no, 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 no. It's true for any job. For any job, you know, yeah. you don't not have to that like they're everybody. they're not nice people, but you're just like, oh, I'm, I'm okay that that trip's over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so every time you meet a new pilot, how does that work? you just like, hey. Yeah, I mean, you... Like obviously a the new normal, pilot you're flying yeah, with. Yeah, normal pleasantries of shaking hands and uh, generally the first thing you ask, they ask you is, oh, where do you live? Because we all live in, in different places. A lot of pilots commute to work. Mm. A lot of pilots don't want to live in major U.S. cities. So they can commute from Pittsburgh to New York or, you know, a lot of pilots live in Florida because the weather's so great. And, mm-hmm. I, and I don't think they have a state income tax. Ooh. I believe I'm not sure. Don't okay. quote me on that. Well, yeah, I'm sure they'd find another way to tax, but a lot of pilots live in Florida cause it's good weather and pilots love to golf. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I've heard and lots of golf courses down there. Yeah. Uh, so it's generally, that's the first thing. Where do you live? Where are you, from? you know, maybe what, how long have you been here? Uh, how was your commute? Did you commute to work? You know, that's kind of a, kind of an icebreaker. Yeah. And, uh, what time did you get to the airport? Just kind of a general feel of how that person's day is going. Yeah. And then generally the next question they ask you is, well, did you take a look at the paperwork? It kind of goes to work straight quick. Yeah. Just to kind of, because we know we're going to have several hours to talk usually later. So it's like, Hey, did you, you know, how's the paper look? Uh, yeah. Does it, does it look good? Does the fuel load look good? Does it look like enough gas and things like that? So you kind of say, yeah, it looks good. You know, unless there's any, huge glaring thing on there that doesn't look right, then it's generally pretty good. And then uh, we usually head out to the airplane and you know, might say, hey, did you get food? You know, just very basic kind of, because you just met this person. You don't know, you know. Uh, does that increase the tension in some there, ways? There is a bit of social anxiety that it creates because there's been, there was a time where uh, I showed up for a flight and I would saw one of the guy one of the guys i knew in the crew room mm-hmm. and i was i said do you know either of these guys like pointing at their names and he's like oh yeah i know that guy oh wow <laughs> so you don't want to hear that from somebody because then it already creates this barrier mm-hmm. and maybe my friend didn't get along with this guy that he's flying with but maybe i'll get along with him fine yeah and that was the case is maybe they just didn't mesh personality wise, but I ended up getting along fine with the guy that he was like, Oh yeah. Wait till you fly with this guy. <laughs> oh wow. The passengers don't want to know that. <laughs> no, I, I not think... that they affect your flying when you're like, you, you know, you don't think about this sort of things mm-hmm. except you are the pilot. I, I doubt a lot of passengers think about the kind of relationship that exists between pilots and even the uh, flight attendants. Sure. Just like, Oh, we're flying. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot going. There's so many moving parts uh, going on whenever whenever you're on an airplane that mm. that nobody sees. Mm. And um, yeah, the the big thing that that we work on up front is just a technique and a it's kind of an institution now, but it's called crew resource management. Okay. And it's kind of this idea that everybody's got an equal voice, and if if something happens, if you make a mistake. You know, because we, we make mistakes. We're human. Mm-hmm. The most experienced guys in the industry make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And my job, even though I am lower on the chain of command, is to say, oh, hey, did you did you want to do this? Mm. And they're usually like, oh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Or oh, I just overlooked that. Mm. And there's not this there's not this hierarchy of you're, you're junior to this person seniority wise. So you don't speak up. 
Okay. It's uh, our goal is always the uh, number one goal is the safe operation of the flight. Mm. And my job is if I see something to speak up, regardless if I feel like I'm younger or mm -hmm. less experienced, mm. because our job is, like I said, to keep everybody safe. And so many humility goes a very long way in my field mm -hmm. because you get a, you get guys that you fly with that uh, extremely experienced, extremely talented pilots from the military mm -hmm. that have flown, um, you know, billion dollar aircraft, you know, have a lot of confidence and not that much arrogance, which yeah. is very, very cool to see. And, and you realize that's how people get where they are sometimes is because they're, they have an element of humility that's not this false humility, but like I, I need you. I need you next to me to help keep us all, all safe yeah, and exactly. make this a smooth ride. Exactly. Nice. So there was this report I read last week of a flight that had to, be, had to go through an emergency landing because of an altercation between two passengers. And it was funny to me what started the altercation in the first place because one of the passengers will not stop farting okay <laughs> and i thought that was hilarious yeah. <laughs> and you know they got into a, a tiff and it, it was really bad the pilot had to land and uh they had to get security officers to escort the offending passenger yeah. off the plane how do you deal with those kind of situations maybe not this particular one but if you were in that, that situation how how, what's the role of the pilot in this sort of situation where, for some reason, other than technical mm -hmm. or even security in terms of, right. say, I mean, terrorism, mm -hmm. what informs the kind of decisions you need to make in that kind of situation? Yeah, it goes back to that, that element of crew, crew resource management, which the very definition of it is to use all available resources that you have to basically generate the best outcome to the situation. Okay. And so the, we're going to talk to the flight attendants. We're going to get the whole story. And we're also going to talk to our company too. We're going to get them the whole story. Mm. And from that information, we look at it and we say, what's the best decision here? You know, or is the situation escalating? Is it de-escalating? De what, what do we need to do? And so that's where we, it, the teamwork thing comes, it comes into play. You've got a problem. You need to, you know, define it, you know, generate some options, evaluate them, select the option, implement it, and then critique it to see if that was the best option. So it's kind of this, this framework that you work through and everybody's talking, everybody's communicating, uh, but you have a whole host of resources at your disposal. Hmm. Okay. So that decision usually to, to land is it's not, not a, it's not a, it's a pilot's decision exactly. alone. He is the ultimate, he or she is the ultimate decision maker for that flight. But okay. none of these decisions get made just because the captain says mm. so. But he will be ultimately responsible because as a good leader or anything like that, you want to you want to solicit input from other people. Because mm. you know, tunnel vision is real and we don't always see every moving part of of an instance that, that you know, we need we need the whole the whole picture to make the best decision. Hmm. all the input from everybody. Okay, as we wind down this conversation, do you have any tips for air travelers generally? I would say, uh, you know, keep traveling because it helps provide me with a paycheck. Well, the sole reason why we have to travel is to provide us with a paycheck. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's I, messing with you going. You know, travel, I, I believe it's it's very important for, for people to travel. I, I say that in jest, but I think I heard a great quote once that... Um, travel makes the old new mm. and a lot of times we think oh we're gonna go i'm gonna go to i'm gonna go to europe see some friends and you leave home and then you come back home and the old that you knew kind of becomes new again you know it's kind of this circle this cycle mm. but it, it gives you a different appreciation for other cultures in the world and other experiences that people have and it helps you create a more uh comprehensive in my opinion worldview yeah and uh, I think it's extremely important for people to keep traveling and for people to not become too insulated mm. in their thoughts and their ideas of um, 
how the world operates how the world operates yeah because you go to other lot of, a lot of places you know that maybe i had some preconceived notions about mm -hmm. and i find out that they're maybe not as different as i thought you know true we, we share so many similarities but also a lot of differences too but it's you know it's building that empathy and, and travel is a great way to to experience that and to kind of round us out as humans and we have the ability with the technology that we have at our disposable to, to fly across the ocean and be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, but again, on a serious note, like patience, you know, none of us on the, the, the flight operations end want somebody to not get where they're going. You mm -hmm. know, if there's a actual s concern for safety, like we're not going to, we're not going to launch into, you know, a situation where your safety is jeopardized. Yeah. You know, cause your job, the reason you paid us to do what we do is to get you there safely. Exactly. And uh, we're never going to take you into a situation that uh, jeopardizes that. Mm -hmm. So patience, if there's mechanical or weather, things like that. You know, the funniest thing for me personally as a, as a person that travels a lot is the fact that we get in an airplane and we travel 500 miles an hour across, you know, from New York to L.A. and you get there in five hours. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the gate and everybody's just like in a hurry to get off the airplane you know just everybody's like grabbing everything rushing the door just like i gotta get out of here and i know you've been kind of cooped up for a while but the fact that you just flew across the country in five hours and it and you paid four hundred dollars to do that and then you know we used to take people they would usually die yeah yeah you know, I mean, like months yeah so i think just keeping things in perspective of I don't know why everybody's in such a rush all the time. I get it. I mean, we're all we're all stuck on this rock together, is what yeah. I like to think. And yeah. Nobody's uh, your plans aren't more important than other people's. Everybody's, mm -hmm. I think, has has plans. And everybody's all, plan is important to them. Exactly, yes. and and we yeah. all should kind of share in that courtesy. You know, not being rude and things like that, and mm. just uh, look out the window every once in a while and not at your screen because <laughs> there's some cool stuff to see out there. Uh, it's kind of hard sometimes, but because you're up so high, uh, I don't have a lot of advice for the traveling public in all seriousness. <laughs> but you, 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 you've talked about a lot of yeah, cool stuff. I, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody will find out useful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for yeah. being on the show, bro. Thank you. That was a good conversation. I think I got to learn more about how the aviation industry works, at least from pilot's point of view, and uh, a lot of the background uh, things that go on right. to get people from point A to point B. And, uh, and finally, I got to know how to start a, a plane. Yeah, it's I really easy. Huh? I can show you if you want. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll take you up on that. That's it for our show. Thank you for listening to this episode. You can support this podcast by going to patreon.com slash friends at work. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash friends at work you can also reach me by email at my friend toye at gmail.com my facebook page is friends at work podcast and my twitter handle is at friends at work us join me next time for another episode of friends at work podcast with ade toye bye for now